and welcome Chris Armstrong. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, and my apologies for not being able to sit in on uh, previous sessions. I just got in from uh, the U.S. moments ago, so got to be got to be agile just in time. Uh, but for those of you that may remember the uh, uh, the event in Cannes a couple years ago, it was a very similar situation. But I didn't even actually have time to change. I showed up in shorts and a Hawaiian uh, shirt, so at least I got a chance to look a little bit uh, a little bit uh, more professional. Today. So what, what I want to talk about is uh, how at APG we've been looking at IT for IT uh, with a, a real broad lens, particularly thinking about it as the enterprise architecture uh, of IT. And uh, again, just a little bit about APG. You know, we're contributors here uh, at the Open Group in uh, TOGAF, uh, Archimate, uh, as well as IT for IT. We're also members of the Object Manager Group, contribute to standards like UML, SysML, BPMN, so on and so forth. And we're uh, partners with a number of tool vendors. And so I presume, uh, uh, again, by not being here, I, I, I've, I've lost the context of what uh, speakers before me have talked about. So I, pre I presume you guys have seen this picture before today, right? So the whole idea of a value chain for uh, the business of IT. And you know, basically, you know, our position you know, to help support this is that you know, if the whole idea of value streams and value chains uh, and capability models are good things for uh, the business, then by God, we should try to apply those things in a similar way to the, uh, the business of IT. And as I'm sure you've also seen uh, similar sort of pictures like this talking about you know, what content uh, is within uh, the IT for IT reference architecture. Um, there's both normative, uh, normative and informative content. Uh, and we're going to take a look at actually some of the uh, more uh, informative stuff, particularly around capabilities, and how we can actually use a, um, an, a TOGAF-driven capability-based planning approach towards trying to improve uh, the business of IT. So you guys have seen this picture, I'm sure, also three or four thousand times today. Um, so uh, uh, you know, again, we really look at this as being a you know logical application architecture. These functional components that represent the kinds of uh, 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 solutions that we need to have in place to manage the business of IT. Uh, the interdependencies between them, um, at, with data objects, the the you know the the data fabric behind it under on top of a service backbone. And I know when when I first looked at this. You know, really coming from again an enterprise architecture uh, perspective, because a big part of what APG does is help end user organizations adopt uh, EA best practices using TOGAF um, and tooling. Is I was like, aha! Finally, we've got something to you know, a, a, an opportunity to get some reuse. Because I'm sure you guys have you know heard this uh, value proposition you know many 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 times, which is you know everybody needs to have IT to run their business, but the kinds of things they need IT to do are pretty uniform across. Um, industry, and so you know the, the whole idea that there's a, a reference architecture out here that we can now leverage uh, in this uh, perspective, I think, is, is very, very, very exciting. So if we take a look at you know, what elements within uh, the IT for IT and how do they map to uh, the, something that some uh, other folks here might be familiar with, uh, the TOGAF 9 content meta model. Um, so we basically you know, did an informal mapping and really considered that what IT for IT has to offer as it relates to this way of describing the enterprise is we got a set of, uh, you know, we got a set of capabilities, although those are uh, informative, uh, some uh, roles, although we, there, there, some of that stuff was, uh, I think, uh, uh, diminished in the 2.0 specification. We've got events, measures, some things around business motivation, you know, drivers, objectives, and goals. Uh, we, of course, have uh, uh, services, logical application components, and data entities. So again, when we just do a, a quick out-of-the-box assessment of, you know, what's within the reference architecture, how does that map to the current best practices in TOGAF, we thought it had a pretty decent coverage, but I'll show you some adjustments that, that we've made based Based on fit for purpose and uh, practice, and I believe we have a schedule, uh, a session scheduled sometime on Thursday to talk a little bit more closely about the alignment between IT for IT and TOGAF, because it seems to us to be a, a, a natural marriage. 
So I presume people are familiar uh, with this picture here, the TOGAF uh, ADM. Again, if you've been in the uh, enterprise architecture uh, sessions, I'm sure you've seen uh, the crop circle uh, diagram a number of times. And it might be new to some of the folks that are stepping in here from an IT for IT perspective, but this is the core uh, development method that TOGAF has to offer, you know, a repeatable uh, tested practice for establishing an enterprise architecture uh, capability, uh, describing uh, baseline and target architectures, and then of course doing that for some purpose, doing it, being able to do some transformational planning, and then actually provide guidance about that uh, transformation planning unfolding uh, with uh, activities in uh, phase G implementation governance. And so what we're going to do is I'm just going to basically take you through uh, kind of a high-level uh, high tour of the TOGAF ADM and how we've been able to exploit uh, the IT for IT reference architecture to do architecture-driven capability-based improvement for IT. And I think the thing that's really exciting about this is that we've actually have, uh, uh, both Charlie and I have been working on a couple of uh, end-user client organizations that have been coincidentally asking for exactly the same thing. So it was a, a very compelling uh, convergence of forces, uh, we're able to you know, try to figure out how do these two uh, wonderful solutions from the open group uh, potentially work together. So what we're sh showing here is a, uh, a very simple UML activity diagram of the steps in the uh, uh, preliminary phase of the TOGAF ADM. This is actually excerpts from a solution that we've created called the uh, APG TOGAF process library, ATPL. We basically built a complete model of the TOGAF F9 standard using an OMG specification called SPEM, the System and Software Process Engineering Meta Model, and then used an Eclipse-based tool to capture all the content that's in the 700 plus pages of the specification. And then one of the nice value adds that we can do is create some simple uh, uh, diagrams like this to represent the uh, behaviors of each individual phase. So in particular, if we take a look at the six steps of uh, the ADM, uh, one of the things we're supposed to do is you know, tailor toga and any other selected architecture framework. So that's where, again, we can do that. Oh, that's where we can do that mapping of uh, the reference architecture to our EA content meta model. And then if we're going to, you know, hopefully be, you know, trying to do this for real, uh, we're going to need to implement this in a set of architecture tools. So we're going to have to go ahead and implement those IT for IT extensions uh, in our enterprise architecture tooling, which, of course, could be a part of modernizing uh, the, the landscape of IT. So we could actually be using IT for IT and TOGAF to implement the ability to do IT for IT using TOGAF. So this is the whole idea of bootstrapping enterprise architecture with enterprise architecture. So if we take a quick look, um, and I don't, my glasses, I can't see that thing there, so I'm going to have to stand over here and hopefully not fall off the edge. Um, so here we basically have a, a very uh, high-level conceptual model of the core IT for IT meta model, the whole idea that we've got a, a value chain that composed of a set of value streams, those map to uh, functional components that may expose a set of services, there are a set of functional requirements that are specified in the uh, uh, normative uh, uh, specification. Those map then down to uh, data objects and relationships among those data objects. There's also the whole idea of a, a state model associated with uh, systems of record uh, integration. And then there's, again, the informative content that's in the, spe in the standard. Again, not necessarily the focus of some of the work that some of the tool vendors are going to be doing to implement uh, the data architecture. Uh, but things, again, like capabilities, key activities, events related to the value stream, uh, crit critical success factors, KPIs. Uh, scenarios, roles, and then again, uh, a generic kind of data flow that incorporates both systems of record of, uh, for integration as well as systems uh, of engagement. And what we've uh, ended up doing, and this is where I'll show you some examples, is we you know, took a, you know, a TOGAF-like meta model um, and then mapped it to things uh, that are pertinent to the IT for IT reference architecture. And so this is based in, in great part uh, by some of the work that we've been doing over the past uh, three, four, five years at Nationwide Insurance in the United States, a property and casualty and financial services organization, where we have the whole idea of uh, uh, business functions uh, mapping to a 
set of capabilities where in, in, in the way that we're looking at business functions, this is a way to represent um, a, a, set, a subset of the organization that's responsible for performing a set of behaviors. So we really think of a function as more of a structural thing as opposed to a first class behavioral thing. We can map uh, processes to scenarios, uh, applications, uh, and, and these are would be physical, real applications, pieces of software that we buy from vendors or build ourselves. We can map those to uh, functional components. Uh, business actors can be related to roles, and then applications can also be in, uh, related to one another through data flows and the data objects that they share. So one of the things, if you haven't you know, uh, uh, had the displeasure of uh, hearing me talk before, is I, I do quite a bit of modeling. Um, and I, I need to build a meta model of like everything in order to understand it and to explain it. Uh, so again, forgive me for all the uh, box and line diagrams we're going to see. But this is the way that I try to make it concrete and real, and hopefully, again, implementable in uh, some of the commercial tools that are out there. So the, the first step in doing architecture transformation in the TOGAF ADM is, is to, a set of activities described in phase A, architecture vision. And this is basically where we're trying to get our arms around, you know, what is the problem uh, that we're trying to solve? Do we agree uh, that it's a good idea to try to solve that problem? What would be some of the essential characteristics of that target state uh, uh, vision? And use that as a way to basically kick off uh, the idea of an architecture project. And of course, this is where a lot a lot of things uh, often uh, go down the tubes in a lot of organization because the whole idea of an architecture project is just something that often makes you know people's uh, eyes cross because in most organizations funding is tied to solution delivery projects and uh, the whole idea with the ADM is that we do a bunch of architectural activities to provide context for what those solution delivery projects should be as it relates to intentionally and deliberately converging on a target architecture. So again, this is an excerpt out of uh, the APG TOGAF process library. Uh, one of the things that's not described in TOGAF that we took liberty to do in these types of diagrams, and particularly in phases A and phase uh, E, opportunities and solutions, is to try to demonstrate that these are really four-way collaborations between different groups of people. It's not just all about the enterprise architects. So we have some organizational development activities, requirements management or business analyst capabilities, uh, enterprise architecture, and project management. And there's a number of uh, a handful of these that are pretty obvious that we can you know exploit reuse out of the IT for IT reference architecture particularly uh, the idea of evaluating uh, business capabilities as a way to help inform us as to where investment opportunities could and should be made based on different characteristics of a capability model uh, we can also uh, use some of the KPIs that are in the reference architecture to help us define you know how are we going to assess uh, the success of reaching that uh, a new state uh, in our IT uh, business. And then uh, we can, you know, we need to articulate in developing the architecture vision, what is our expected outcome? You know, what are we trying to get out of you taking an architecture-driven approach towards uh, modernizing and uplifting IT, such as are we trying to simplify the environment, are we trying to optimize the environment, or are we try to do innovation, so on and so forth. So here we have an example of a you know a heat map uh, that we've created using the uh, the IT for IT uh, reference architecture, um, based on the idea that there's a couple of attributes about a capability such as its current uh, maturity, future maturity, current level of performance, future level of performance, and we'll we'll dive a little deeper into some more empirical uh, measures uh, in just a little bit. But this is a pretty typical way that I presume you guys have seen enterprise architecture content uh, rendered before. Again, we've got. The, uh, the four value streams are the outer boxes, strategy to portfolio, requirement to deploy, request to fulfill, detect to correct. And then these are the capabilities that are a part of the IT for IT reference architecture. Again, these are the informative uh, part of the standard, uh, not normative, but we find them very uh, useful nonetheless. And again, using a typical five level scale for representing a current level of maturity to try to give us an idea of, you know, based on a pure capability uh, maturity perspective, where, sh where are the places that we need uh, some of the most help and based on this diagram it looks like you know procurement project management service level management are some of the places that uh, are pretty much chaotic and are dependent on the heroic efforts of individuals 
And again, when we think about you know what are when we're articulating an architecture vision, what is some of the uh, you know expected outcome of, of you know taking an enterprise architecture driven approach for towards modernizing and uplifting the business of IT might be again doing IT capability management. I mean, how many folks out there uh, in your organizations are using a capability based approach for trying to wrap your arms around the business? Couple of people. All right. So you know, some opportunity for uh, looking at this perhaps a little bit more closely. It's a very big trend that we've been seeing, um, at least in the U.S., with a lot of our clients. That again, a capability-driven approach based on uh, providing context inside of a value stream to again inform people on where they should be making investments is a, a good place to start. Um, one of the things that I think is a really important thing to think about is you know we do a lot of activities you know primarily to support um, the frontline. Uh, Business uh, uh, functions of our organization, but we can put, we can you know uh, take those things and, and apply them introspectively as well. So the whole idea of doing application portfolio management for the IT applications that run the business of IT, and we see a lot of organizations focus on doing application portfolio management of the normal business applications. And how many of your organizations do APM for business uh, applications? And how many of those do it similarly on IT applications? All right, so we got some uh, people that saw the opportunity to not be a hypocrite, because um, that's one of the things that obviously you're at risk at doing when you're trying to do enterprise architecture to everybody else, but overlook the opportunity and how we can use enterprise architecture to improve IT. Uh, then we've got the whole idea of uh, using enterprise architecture to set up an IT data management uh, foundation. Uh, one of the common situations that we've seen uh, pervasively throughout uh, a lot of our clients, and this is a big part of what you know the the the, the data fabric um, and the schemas that are going to be coming out of IT for IT are going to try to address, is that all IT apps want all the data from all other IT apps. And so we end up seeing a lot of point-to-point -point integration between you know, 60 to 70 IT apps. And then what ends up happening is we end up losing track of what the actual system of record is because some people are taking shortcuts and getting data from intermediate transient systems that get it from an original source system. So we see a lot of opportunity where uh, IT, for IT can help with that. Uh, technology lifecycle management, again, particularly trying to put a, a, an agile spin on that, particularly as it also relates to uh, trying to implement uh, lean IT a la concepts around uh, Agile and DevOps. So just a, a quick glimpse, of, if you haven't read through the whole uh, standard, here are uh, some examples of the KPIs that are associated with the first value stream strategy to portfolio. So things like uh, trying to understand you know, business and IT alignment, visibility into our overall demands, uh, how well we're you know, rationalizing our service portfolio, doing the financial analysis on our service portfolio. And I think we got another well, yep, another set here as well. Um, uh, investment tracking, uh, customer satisfaction, stewardship of IT investments, as well as, of course, uh, information risk management and uh, security alignment. And, you know, again, we've been using this content in a number of our end user organizations to, again, to not have to just get up in front of a, you know, a C-level set of executives and scratch our head about, gee, how would we know if IT got better? Again, the reference architecture with IT for IT has a lot to offer. So now let's continue on in the crop circle and go to phase B business architecture. So this, of course, is where uh, the capability model uh, becomes even more uh, pervasive. And so if we take a look at the different uh, steps of this particular life cycle, and this, the, these steps are also consistent uh, with the remaining uh, uh, architecture description phases for application architecture, uh, data architecture, and technology architecture. Um, so we call this the nine-step program. Uh, we need to start off by selecting reference models, uh, viewpoints, and tools. So again, that's where we can use IT for IT as a reference architecture to get us going. Uh, again, if we're using the capability model, which is what we're going to take a look at in just a, a couple of minutes. We can use that capability model to map things that we're dis discovering in our uh, baseline and target uh, business application and uh, data architectures. Uh, we can use the reference architecture as a foundation for doing a gap analysis and for doing a capability-based impact analysis. And this is where you know we find, again, having a, um, a capability uh, lens on the IT investment portfolio 
portfolio uh, uh, is a really important thing because we find a lot of organizations are you know, making investments and in, in trying to understand how much they're spending and different capabilities, what the health of their capabilities are, the agility of their capabilities. And that's good to understand those baseline assessments, but we also need to understand investments that are in flight, so having some uh, traceability between our enterprise architecture capability model and our uh, portfolio management capability of projects and programs in flight uh, is a great way to you know, uh, uplift the rigor in uh, that part of the life cycle. So one of the, the, the nice things that, uh, uh, that I like also about the, the IT for IT uh, reference architecture is that we've been taking a model-driven approach towards doing this, um, and I find this uh, very encouraging. Um, so, and I don't know if you guys have talked earlier today about the state of the IT for IT model uh, in uh, Sparks Enterprise Architect, and is that an asset that we're still thinking about how we make that available to the general public? So work in progress, and, and I'm just here to say, you know, one of the privileges of membership is, you know, we get access to that, but I think it would be a great value add for the end user uh, community because, you know, having the reference architecture in a PDF is better than nothing, but then why should everybody have to type it all over again uh, to, you know, use that in enterprise architecture tool sets? Uh, so there's a, a, ver a very nice, uh, complete model that's been uh, uh, the basis for trying to pull all this stuff together. So here we see the same uh, four uh, value streams and uh, some of the different uh, chunks of model content around uh, you know, capabilities, functional capabilities, data objects, and uh, capability, ma uh, capability mapping. And we'll take a, a brief look at uh, some of those as well. So here we see uh, the capability model. It's a very simple capability model. When I take a look at the ones that are most frequently used by uh, lines of business, uh, they tend to be you know, two, three, four, five, sometimes even uh, uh, deeper levels of hierarchy. This one is pretty straightforward. It's just a two-level hierarchy where we've got the uh, value stream at the top and then these capabilities under the, uh, underneath them. Um, as some of you may uh, recognize or you may have already been aware of this, is that, again, IT for IT is using the Archimate notation, another open group standard, uh, to represent the IT for IT reference architecture. Uh, but one of the things that we had to do is we had to go beyond what Archimate uh, 2.1 currently offers. For example, there's no such thing as a capability within uh, Archimate, although that's something we're talking about uh, for the next version. Uh, there's also some uh, nice uh, default uh, capability interactions that are described that basically show, in the case of the, the strategy to portfolio value stream and related value streams, you know, how do these different capabilities interact with one another, and what are some of the events that trigger these interaction, and then some of the outgoing uh, consequential events. So again, I think, uh, again, having a, 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 a straw man of some business architecture content to describe the business IT, I think, is uh, pretty exciting and pretty compelling particularly when we take a look at how we can try to exploit that. And we'll take a look at that here when we take a, a closer look into uh, data architecture and application architecture. So if we take a look at uh, you know, some of the, the data object, uh, data architecture content, uh, you know, we basically have for each of the value streams, here is a detect for correct, uh, some of the, um, you know, the core business objects, the underlying uh, service backbone, um, and uh, ancillary objects to have been basically kind of give us a head start on uh, what these uh, different types of data elements are, what their semantics are, and their relationships. Uh, one of the things that uh, Archimate doesn't address terribly explicitly is the whole idea of attributes for data objects. So the team's been using basically UML uh, classes to represent uh, the ex explicit properties for some of these different elements uh, to, again, provide a little bit more fidelity about what we mean by each of these data objects. And then for uh, a particular kind of data flow, if you remember back a couple of uh, uh, class diagrams before, uh, there's a, you know, systems of engagement interaction or in integrations and systems of record integration. And this is, a, even though it's not necessarily ex uh, explicitly uh, uh, shown this way, I, I really look at these as UML state machine diagrams. Again, trying to represent what are the different states of these different entities and how are they coupled with one another? Because that's often the real trick that the change in state of a 
particular object uh, informs and perhaps changes the state of a related object. So here we're trying to represent the relationship between the event and the incident uh, data object um, and the states of each of them and then the little dashed lines between them are trying to represent how, uh, again, something that's in progress, an event that's in progress causes the associated incident uh, to be open. So really taking a, a systematic a model-driven approach towards really trying to wrap our brains around the data architecture of IT. And then if we take a look at uh, application architecture, uh, this is again certainly the, the focal point of uh, you know, the functional component the description of the landscape. So here we see uh, the strategy to portfolio value stream, the functional components, uh, some of the relationships uh, and data that's flowing in between them from outside as well as uh, the, the, the data fabric and the relationships uh, between those. So to, to us, even though they're not uh, called this in the IT for IT meta model, these are, again, functional components. They are ultimately um, um, uh, logical application components per the TOGAF 9 meta model. So they describe you know, the kinds of things that pieces of software should do without necessarily naming an explicit piece of software. But of course, in the real world, we actually have explicit pieces of software. So here what we see is just a simple example of how we started off by taking um, and we actually, for whatever it's worth, we went to a, a BDNA's Technopedia. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Um, as a, you know, the, 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 the de facto knowledge base of all software products known to man on the planet Earth. Um, a great business model, wish I had thought of it, um, to basically alleviate end users from having to call the same vendors and ask them the same questions all the time. So we went into uh, Technopedia and basically selected a bunch of IT applications as an example for the next set of uh, slides that you'll see and then mapped those uh, applications to capabilities. Uh, so here we've got, you know, Sparks Enterprise Architect is being used for architecture, you know, Salesforce and Microsoft CRM are used for customer relationship management, uh, change management tools, defect management tools. And then uh, what we're representing here is a uh, derived health score and risk score. Uh, we've worked with a lot of organizations uh, coming up with some empirical uh, methods for calculating these different things. You know, for whatever it's worth, this data here is, you know, just random numbers for the purposes of, uh, of doing some nice color coding that you'll see in a little bit. But the idea that, you know, the health of an application can be based on uh, its uh, number of defects in the backlog, um, the skill set uh, availability, um, the number of security vulnerabilities, the risks associated with it can also be quantified empirically with different sorts of measures. And then, um, uh, the, the actual cost um, of operating each of these assets. Uh, one of the things that perhaps, you know, coming from an enterprise architecture perspective as opposed to an IT ops perspective that I was uh, pretty surprised by is how little most companies know how much they spend on applications. They know they spend a bunch of money on a bunch of applications, but it's not real clear exactly how much did we spend on this application, so on and so forth. So we're coming up with an, an, an understanding of how much does it cost to support and operate these assets is not a simple thing uh, at all. And in the places where we've been able to implement it has often required some re-engineering in IT finance as it relates to how they track and report uh, financial data. And of course, cost information uh, often has multiple components, licensing costs, labor costs, PPM costs, licensing costs, uh, so on and so forth. So I, I guess what, I wanna, what I'm trying to say is that you know the simple data values that you see here, there may be quite a bit of uh, uh, heavy lifting and re-architecting of the enterprise to really figure out what those things are from an empirical uh, perspective. And then uh, a typical kind of in investment disposition about where do we want to make our investments in these particular physical applications as we uh, take the IT landscape forward. And then, so here we see again an explicit mapping of these uh, applications to the uh, capabilities uh, using uh, the kind of architecture tooling you'd expect to use uh, in modern day uh, solution or enterprise architecture projects. And then this gives us the ability to create similar sorts of uh, heat maps, where in this case, this is the uh, strategy to portfolio uh, value stream. We're just, showing, or, uh, we're just showing one slice of the four. And then the, the top level capabilities in each one, and just to keep things simple, 
you know, a couple, two, three uh, actual physical software applications that are supporting each one of those capabilities with a investment disposition being indicated with colors about whether it's strategic, we want to maintain it, or we want to retire it. And then, uh, you know, for whatever it's worth, uh, this just might be me coming from, you know, the top level down. You know, sure, you know, the enterprise architecture of the uh, of IT does involve uh, technology architecture, but that's you know simple stuff. You know, you got databases and application servers and networks and stuff like that. Uh, to, you know, again, the, the, I think we would do th those types of activities very traditionally, the way we would do a lot of uh, of uh, technology uh, lifecycle management. But now let's talk about really the, you know, the so what uh, about all this stuff. So great, so I got the IT for IT reference architecture. I've got you know, models and tools you know, to map all this stuff out. Again, we're not doing this just because we got nothing better to do. We're actually supposed to be helping us uh, uh, inform decision making, put together a plan of action, and then execute it. And that's really what uh, the whole point of phase E in the TOGAF ADM is all about. So, uh, you know, what you're, gonna, what you're gonna take a look at in the upcoming slides is an implementation, again, of, of this fit-for-purpose capability-based planning uh, meta model. Uh, for whatever it's worth, you know, we're thinking uh, of, you know, trying to influence the architecture form in, you know, uh, making capabilities a first-class element in the TOGAF, uh, the next uh, version of TOGAF meta model, because it kind of just hangs off uh, phase E stuff in the current meta model. But the idea that, you know, again, we've got a, a value chain, that's composed of value streams that then are mapped to capabilities. Um, and those capabilities, again, may have a child-parent relationship, so there may be a hierarchical decomposition. We've got the idea that there may be some you know, performance and maturity indicators about the current state and the future state, uh, investment disposition, but also the idea that there are uh, different categories of capabilities. I'll figure this out before the end of the presentation. And uh, different types of capabilities. And so this is the idea that a capability is core to our business. It supports the core. And then what we've been seeing uh, more recently is the idea of enabling capabilities, which often tend to be very technological in their emphases, but are still considered business capabilities, but they have a lot of technology to make them actually work. And then we've got, you know, what kind of cap or what type of capabilities? Is this a com competitive capability? Is it a differentiating capability or is it a commodity capability? And these are, again, additional dimensions that can help inform us do investment planning because what we see in a lot of organizations is people making, uh, you know, seven, eight-figure investments in things that presumably they already decided were non-differentiating or spending custom application uh, dollars on a commodity uh, capability that could be supported by a package implementation, uh, for example. Then we've got, again, applications being uh, mapped to those capabilities, so supporting them, in addition to having, uh, again, a health score, risk score, annual cost, investment disposition. We want to understand their operational status, as well as some dates about their uh, overall life cycle. And we want to have some idea about how uh, the capabilities map to processes, and how those processes may need to be uplifted in the business architecture and a set of requirements that describe what we're going to do when we actually drive uh, the architecture transformation. And so here we have an example of, of uh, the application level data that you saw in the Excel spreadsheet earlier has now been aggregated up to the capability model where we can see um, an average health score and an average risk score and a total cost sorry about that, as well as, again, different properties um, of each one of these capabilities. And then we're able to, again, create additional views of the IT application landscape, again, through this capability model, uh, capability model lens. And this is basically trying to represent the health uh, or the relative health of each of these capabilities based on the health of the underlying IT applications. So again, we see, uh, again, a similar sort of uh, uh, green, yellow, red uh, color coding here to again inform us where we should be making our investments or where we should not be making our investments. 
And one of the things that we'd expect to be able to produce um, out of our uh, repository is some sort of uh, life cycle roadmap, something that's trying to show the evolution of uh, these different uh, IT applications over time. And so here we see, you know, Sparks Enterprise Architect version 12 is, you know, proposed in 2014. It's under development in the second part of 2014, and then it becomes operational in 2015. And then, you know, additional uh, operational states having to do with decommissioning, or that we want to decommission it, um, that it's been decommissioned and it's actually been retired. And looking for that overlap and making sure that we don't have any gaps as we're uplifting uh, existing applications and retiring old ones. So when we're in phase E, opportunities and solutions, we're trying to do, uh, again, a similar four-way collaboration between uh, business analysis or requirements management, organizational development, EA, and program management. Uh, two of the activities that I think, uh, again, IT for IT helps us out explicitly is for, uh, again, consolidating the results of gap analysis and then using uh, Archimate and the IT for IT reference architecture to define the major chunks of work as they're called in uh, TOGAF and Archimate uh, work packages. And so here we're basically, uh, you know, this is very representative of some of the work we've been doing with some U.S.-based clients. You know, we, there's a current IT operating model, version 2.0, and this, is, this symbol here, this little cube with the little steps on it, is the representation of a plateau, which is Archimate's uh, uh, language for a state of the architecture. So the baseline architecture is represented by a plateau, the target architecture is represented by a plateau, and all transition architectures in between are also represented represented by plateaus. So here we're basically trying to say using Archimate, uh, the IT operating model version 2.0 is going to be related to a new IT operating model version 2.1, and it's going to be based on uh, uh, us actually creating three different deliverables. So what's the outcome of achieving uh, ITOM uh, 2.1? Increased enterprise architecture reuse, uh, reduced complexity of the IT landscape, and streamlined uh, service demand management, just as a uh, an example. And then we can go and do a whole bunch of architecture work, you know, do our mappings uh, of, um, of capabilities to applications, uh, describe the interactions between our applications, uh, describe which processes that we're using. So in this particular case, uh, the, uh, the target plateau has uh, new versions of some of these software applications and some existing versions as well, as well as some new versions of processes about we're going to have a new process for configuring our tools, a new way of managing enterprise architecture version 2.1 and a 2.0 version of managing uh, product development. And then uh, what I, I neglected to show you just because I didn't want to overwhelm you with too many uh, models, although if you're, if you're interested in more, stop by. I'll be happy to uh, sling models at you all, all night long. Um, is we actually then do a comparison of the baseline ITOM 2.0 plateau to the ITOM 2.1 plateau. And then uh, out of that, we're able to basically actually generate the gap analysis. So TOGAF talks about gap analysis being per perhaps an activity that's performed by people. We feel that if you've got the right kind of tooling behind it, that you should be able to exploit your tools to help you do this. And so here we've got the whole idea of, again, the baseline and target plateaus, uh, what elements, um, both capabilities, applications, and processes are we going to preserve? So those are things in the current state that are going to also exist as is in the target state. What things we're actually going to eliminate, and what are some new things that we're actually going to create? And uh, I didn't have time to prepare uh, an alternate view of this, uh, but it would, it would make a lot of sense to represent this graphically as well, as opposed to also just a, you know, a, a tabular report or what TOGAF calls a uh, catalog. And so when we think about trying to, you know, uh, map this whole idea of a plateau and work packages and other elements to a, uh, an actual roadmap, uh, we took a look at the Archimate Med model and uh, refined it and made it a little bit more constrained. So first of all, the whole idea of a roadmap is basically something that describes a set of architectural elements that have a life cycle state that's changing over time uh, based on, you know, that the fact that the, uh, um, the road 
roadmap has a time span, usually based on quarters, um, and that we can basically um, you know, represent that that roadmap is related to a particular plateau. Uh, that plateau is an aggregation of work packages, which may turn out to be programs or projects when we actually get down to uh, fine grain portfolio management. But that's associated with um, addressing a cert certain set of requirements that are going to address uh, the gaps that we've identified. And so here we've got uh, the actual uh, work packages. So for the, the IT operating model 2.1, we've got a, you know, an enterprise architecture tool implementation, a, uh, a tool integration work stream with another product we've created, model flow, and then uh, upgrading some other APG tools. So we basically said, kind of seems like there's three chunks of work to do in order to reach this uh, ITOM 2.1 uh, target architecture. And then I want to try to, you know, really figure out, well, what does it mean to deliver this? So, you know, what we have basically here is a, you know, a five-way traceability view where we've got, you know, the bodies of work in the middle. So those are the three uh, work packages that we saw before. Uh, the processes that are a part of the target state. The applications that are a part of the target state. And then identifying a set of requirements of what are we going to do to actually improve or change each of the processes and associated uh, applications. Applications, And again, the requirements are these little uh, rectangle uh, or octagonal things uh, in purple in the second and fourth swim lane. And then after we've connected those requirements to uh, the different parts of the plateau, we can then create an integrated uh, report that represents what different things are we going to have to change about different applications and different processes as it relates to achieving the target architecture of the IT operating model uh, version 2.0. Point one. So, conclusions. Um, our experience is certainly indicating that IT for IT provides you know, a fantastic foundation for helping us apply enterprise architecture towards trying to transform uh, the business of IT, whether that's in you know, capability management, information management, portfolio management, lifecycle management, uh, lean IT. And of course, uh, IT for IT by itself is a great, wonderful thing, but when you, when you couple it with the TOGAF uh, uh, standard in particular, the architecture development method and how we can use Archimate to do visualization um, of our architectures. It seems to us to be a, a, a hopefully a, a, an effective demonstration of how we can really exploit three standards that the Open Group uh, has uh, invested in. So, that's what I got for you guys. Uh, thanks so much for your uh, kind participation and attention.